Hello, my name is Katrina Nicolina Jorgensen Aha, but you can call me Nick. I have dyslexia, so I have a strong insight on how it is to be dyslexic. However, I only recently found out and fully understood what it means to be dyslexic. And that has truly changed my life and perspective of dyslexia. But yeah, he's, he doesn't let any of us sleep in the night, so. Do you think I'm annoying? Huh? Do you think I'm annoying? I remember that I was first diagnosed with uh, dyslexia when I was 15 years old. I absolutely hate reading books. Uh, I remember in school I had to read this book and um, I read the first paragraph and I was so proud of myself but then that, uh, that week or that day when I came in again everyone else had read like half the book. At that point I didn't know I was dyslexic but I really didn't understand why why this was happening. Why, why, why was I so much slower than everyone else? And I didn't think much of it back then. I just thought, oh, I'm slow, that's okay. But when I got older, I didn't really catch up even though I was working hard. And I remember that people just thought I was lazy and they didn't believe that I was working hard and they thought that I was just slagging it off. When I found out I was dyslexic, I, I didn't even know what that meant. Dyslexia is caused by a phonological processing problem meaning people affected by it have trouble not with seeing language, but with manipulating it. For example, if you heard the word cat and then someone asked you, remove the C, what word would you have left? At. This can be difficult for those with dyslexia. Given a word in isolation like fantastic, students with dyslexia need to break the word into parts to read it. fan tas tick time spent decoding makes it hard to keep up with peers and gain sufficient comprehension. Spelling words phonetically like S-T-I-K for stick and F-R-E-N-S for friends is also common. Uh, my my uh, problem most of all was probably uh, uh, how they misunderstood you to be lazy and stupid. Yes, same yeah. thing. I got accused of those same words, even for the military. So I'm, I'm talking over the top of you, but yeah, it, it, yeah, I echo the exactly same thing, and it, 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 it upset me because I've put so much effort into something I was struggling with, mm. and then being told I'm doing the opposite. You know, you're not putting the effort in. You're being lazy. You're a daydreamer, and it wasn't the case. I think yeah. that's a good word to use, isn't it? Misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. And I think it goes down to what knowledge of the of of dyslexia and Erlen's, the the teacher, the lecturer, um, your school, you know is aware of. I think it was very interesting what Paul said, that he felt like he was misunderstood to be lazy and stupid because of the teacher's lack of knowledge of dyslexia. I know for a fact that many dyslexic feel this way, that they are misunderstood by their teachers and peers to be stupid and lazy. However, some would argue that it's not the teacher's fault. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I started training in 2005. So I did what was then known as the 7407. Now that's since become Petals, Dettles and Kettles. So when I did it, it was three one year long courses. So I did my, my stage one, 
was it one year long course stage two was one year long course stage two was one day. And, and each one was just like pretty much the same but in more detail they replaced that um i think in about 2008 2009 with petals dettles and kettles so it's preparation for teaching and learning in a lifelong learning sector um so that became instead of a, a one a year long course that became a six-week course and the second year became a 12 and the, the third stage three stayed as being a year-long course but obviously if you're going to cut you know, a 12-month course down to six weeks you're going to lose stuff um the other thing is i was very lucky when i did my year one course the the college actually messed up and what they did is they brought in someone very qualified to teach teaching and how is that I, a messed up thing because the college didn't mean to, because my second and third years didn't have the same person. And oh my God, it just was not as good. And I've also had further teachers. So when I came to this college, I also had a short course, a short level two, just to make sure my teachers was okay. And it was like, yeah, okay. I have not had that same quality of teaching as I did in that first year of my teacher training course. And it was, they were considering all this stuff. And it was, oh, it was beautiful to watch, seriously. So I know it's, you know, there is this training does exist. But it, somehow it's got to a point where it's not consistent. So, for instance, there's there's um, a way of qualifying for a teacher which is quick and on the job. And I don't think you get the chance to kind of go into it in that kind of thing because a lot of teacher training is put out to tender. So it means different companies will do you know, the bare minimum cheaper. And quite often you get teachers coming very, very unprepared into uh, into school. Dyslexia can cause real challenges in traditional education memorizing lots of facts and figures, uh, it can be difficult. One in five children suffer from dyslexia. That's 20% of the classroom. And yet, teachers aren't trained to recognize it. I think it's vital that teachers are trained about dyslexics. And there's gonna be a lot of kids whose potential are lost unless we train our teachers to effectively teach them. Common, I know I've been in a job that long, I've had a number of lockdowns we've had, but what seems to be a common theme is with the student is, they put themselves down. Mm. They think they lack the intelligence. They think they haven't got the ability. Yeah. Um, but what I've, I've, I've read from research as well is those who have dyslexia with early and, and early difficulties have at least average intelligence. And I think it works out about a third does have um, some kind of specific quality um, being able to achieve. Or, you know, it was engineering, when it's in mathematics. Mm. They need to understand that they have dyslexia or they have Erlen's and they have other disabilities. It's how we go about helping them to cope or to overcome yeah. and to realise they have intelligence. You know, they have the ability. It's given that confidence and belief to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, they, they, they just think different. That's that's the whole yeah. point in dyslexia, because you could you could say there, there's this really cool saying where they uh, Einstein who also was funny enough yes. dyslexic if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree it will think it is stupid his whole life you know it's it's mm. telling us a story how uh because of the educational system you are judged by the things mm. that you cannot do neurodiversity is the idea that because all our brains show differences in structure and function, we shouldn't be so quick to label every deviation from the norm as a pathological disorder, or dismiss people living with these variations as defective. People with neurobiological variations like dyslexia, including such creative and inventive individuals as Picasso, Muhammad Ali, Whoopi Goldberg, Steven Spielberg, and Cher, clearly have every capacity to be brilliant and successful in life. So here's the special way the brains of those with dyslexia work. The brain is divided into two hemispheres. The left hemisphere is generally in charge of language and ultimately reading, while the right typically handles spatial activities. fMRI studies have found that the brains of those with dyslexia rely more on the right hemisphere and frontal lobe than the brains of those without it. This means when they read a word, it takes a longer trip through their brain and can get delayed in the frontal lobe. Because of this neurobiological glitch, they read with more difficulty. Dyslexia is most commonly understood as this reading issue. Uh, you know, we have a tendency of flipping our B's and our D's and our Q's and our G's. And that's, you know, I think that's, that's a fair assessment, at least in the, uh, the symptomatic 
department. But I want to take this opportunity to speak a little bit more in depth about the neuroscience of dyslexia. So we have this outer layer of our brain called the cortex. Okay, and we all know that we have these little things, or maybe we don't know, but we have these little things called mini columns. Okay, and these mini columns serve as telephone poles, if you will. What strings together on these mini columns are our axons. Okay, now people with autism, for example, have axons that are extremely close closely located to, in proximity to each other. And as a result, their axon lengths are very, very finite and short. And as a result, they are able to do these incredibly detailed, highly specific uh, patterns and, and, and behaviors and skills, right? Well, dyslexics are on the other side of that spectrum. We have our mini columns that are spaced very, very far apart. As a result, our axon lengths are significantly longer. And this actually lends to some significant cognitive advantages. We have an ability to look at a situation and identify seemingly disparate pieces of information and blend those into a narrative or a tapestry that makes sense to us that most people can't see. Gentlemen, I'd like to have a chat to you about dyslexia. Anyone be interested in having a dyslexic baby? What the hell kind of a question is that? World's first dyslexic sperm bank. Open today. Hello, good morning. What's brought you in today? Just a bit intrigued, actually. <laughs> Tell me, what do you know about dyslexia? I don't know, is that get jumbled up with writing? In that disability? You're kind of siphoned off and put in the, the special room. A lot of people think that people with dyslexia are stupid. I've heard that word used a lot. Given the choice, yeah. would you like your child to have dyslexia? No. I wouldn't kill it. I have a restaurant. Right. My head chef is dyslexic. OK. And there's certain things I just wouldn't give him to do at all. Only 3% of people see dyslexia as anything other than a disadvantage. But look at the people around this room. Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple, inventor of the iPhone. Who's more of an icon for genius than Albert Einstein? We've got a whole catalogue here full of people who uh, are or were dyslexic, like Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone. Dyslexics have a difference in their brains that makes them literally see the world a bit differently. What a lot of good-looking ones. Love. Slightly jealous. <laughs> Did you know that 40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic? Say that again. What? That's amazing. It hasn't held any of them back. And the value of these individuals and their contribution to all areas is just really yeah. encouraging. And all of these dynamic achievers need to be given up as positive examples. It does not need to be a barrier to achievement. If you were thinking about how most people see dyslexia, what, what words do you think people would use to describe them? Uh, at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But by the sounds of it, they're not. Quite an eye-opener, really, wasn't it? And very funny in places as well. That uh, social research film was done in conjunction with some extremely hard-hitting research by YouGov that looked at the public perception or misconception around dyslexia. Only 3% of people see dyslexia as an advantage or anything other than a disadvantage. Yet, we've seen from that film, so many incredible people, dyslexic people, have gone on to do incredible things. Our brains, uh, they're wired to, I think, process information differently. It's just the way that you see the world. I don't think people do think the way I think. <laughs> and we're curious. Uh, we're creative. The way I see the world might be different from somebody else but that's valid. In fact, it's vital. The imagination, the storytelling, the communication, the empathy, all these positives. We can simplify things. Uh, we see the big picture. In a world which is 
pretty competitive. I think to be able to look at it differently is a huge advantage. My spelling makes people laugh. It makes me laugh, actually. And my reading, if I'm sight reading, oh, it's, it's a complete joke. Right, it's far more. There's a whole kind, as you said, there's a whole kind of set of things going on there. Is it a gift or is it a disability or is it just neutral? Like, in some situations, it's actually a, uh, my dad calls it a superpower. <laughs> Yep. And other situations, it's like a really horrible disadvantage kind of thing. Uh, but if the thing is, if you learn these tricks, if you get, like learn how to handle it, like understand how your brain works, understand what is it you're good at, what is it you're bad at, stick to the things that you're bad at and make someone else do the things that you're bad at. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, I get you on that. It's like you said before, the kind of you know, judging a fish's ability to climb a tree. Mm. Uh, it's, it, yeah, because we, we live in a world that's defined in this kind of term when you don't fit in the box, it's seen as an outlier. Well, actually, evolution would say that person doesn't fit in the box. That's the person. If that's successful, then that you know, the norm heads in that direction. What is, what is the bigger curse to kind of be thinking differently to other people or not to be able to recognize that that different thinking is, is absolutely essential? Because different thinkers are what makes it, you want people to be thinking differently. You get a group of people and they all think differently, they'll come together and they'll find the best solution to any problem. You get a bunch of people all thinking exactly the same way, you'll get a solution. But I'm sorry, it won't be any good because you're, oh, yes, that's the right one. And there's no critical thinking in there. This difference of thinking and that understanding how different people perceive things and think about this, that's essential. That is critical thinking. That is what it is to be human. That difference is us, our humanity. I'm, I'm with you on the superpower thing. And I think for kids who are struggling at school, um, you know, I think the important thing is just is, is to try to just try to think of the one the one thing they're good at, and then just try to become really good at, good at that. Learning difficulties or, or learning problems weren't really even considered when I was at school. They were beginning to be. So people like me would have gone through a system of education where you were streamed absolutely on your exam results. So if you were tested and tested, I would come fairly well down the bottom for things like that. Interestingly, I was reasonably good at things like art. I can't paint. But I could have quite, a, I had quite good ideas. So there was an artistic thing in me at that point. But people didn't take that as seriously. So well, my teachers felt that when they talked to me, that actually it didn't match up to the things I was putting on the paper. So there was a disconnect that they could see between how they felt I was as a person in terms of in intelligence or education and how that translated into formal tests. Uh, there, there were teachers that didn't quite understand why I, I, I was I was so behind the rest of the class and my reading skills, and talked to my parents about it. But there was there, there was nothing, you know. We're talking about the 1950s, yeah. And there was there was not a program that was there. There were not books There's being nothing. written yeah. about dyslexia. Nobody diagnosed me as being dyslexic, and so all they could do was assume that I wasn't studying hard enough, that I wasn't mm. reading You're hard lazy. enough that I was perhaps uh, lazy, yes. Well, I didn't know I was dyslexic when I was at school. Um, I just thought I was maybe stupid. Um, and, um, you know, I'd look at an IQ test and, you know, have a complete blank. I just couldn't fill in anything. Um, you know, the same way that if I look at a Times crossword, you know, I'll have the same, same problem today. And so, uh, you know, so basically I was, I was absolutely hopeless when it came to conventional education. But I knew what I was interested in and, um, um, you know, I was in very much, very interested in what was going on in the world. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I heard about the Vietnam War, which was an unnecessary war that the Americans were fighting. Um, and, um, and I just thought, look, maybe I should get out of school and try to campaign to stop this war. You know, just enthusiastic young 15 year old, um, but, um, you know, thought it was um, that was more important than me wasting my time trying to do school school work, which, which I couldn't do anyway. I think I, I think I think that if you're not good at conventional uh, work at school, um, you're made to feel stupid. So a guy I went to school with, 
uh, when he got to be 16 and he was leaving school, he could he could just about write his name. That was it. He was always called Dim. That was part of his nickname at school. It kind of was a was a tag that he was given by the teachers and by the other students. He got himself a job on a building site, which is what people would have expected him to do as a labourer. But you could earn a lot of money. But what he secretly did was he he wrote on a, a letter to himself two goals for life. And he sealed up the envelope and he put it away. So he earned some money and he realized that he could achieve his first goal. And his first goal was to buy a fish and chip shop. Right? Doesn't sound much. Crazy thing. So he bought a fish and chip shop in Taunton, not very far away from here. And he ran that and made an absolute fortune. Sold half the business to his brother. So he's like a sleeping partner in it. He still gets a bit of income from it. And then he thought, this is after like 35 years or 30 years, he decided he was going to do his uh, second goal, which was the sort of outrageous one. I'm glad you're sitting down. So he set himself up as a private detective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he set himself up as a private detective. He's retired now because he made so much money again. But he had an office in London and an office in Dublin. And he would trace people who were missing and trace people who'd been left money in wills and they couldn't find any relatives. And that was his outrageous, never achievable goal. So there's a guy who, uh, through his own um, strength of character, fought through the dyslexic tag, being called dim all the way through school and made something of himself. And I admire that guy immensely. You know, there are positive stories from dyslexia. It's not all doom and gloom. Yes, that's actually the next thing I want to talk to you about. Some people would argue uh, that dyslexia is actually not a disadvantage. What do you think about that? Yes, I certainly think dyslexia is not a disadvantage. I think it needs treating right at the school level because we have these formal things that everybody has to do at school, English, maths and stuff like that. But outside of those, there are areas where I feel dyslexia enables people rather than restricts what they can do. And I certainly think we see a high proportion of, of dyslexic people in the creative industries. And I think part of that is, like the guy I was telling you about who bought a chip shop and ended up as a private detective, he had workarounds. And I think the creative mind for a dyslexic allows you to find workarounds that are not what normal people would do, but it enables you to get to the next step. And I think people have, are a, people, dyslexic people are able to plan those kind of things out in a way that you've heard people talk about people who think outside of the box. And I think dyslexic people do that very well. So they don't see things as being black and white or flat, no perspective. They see things in a way that there are opportunities creatively. We talk a lot about how a dyslexic learner is not made for the traditional classroom, they're made for the world. And it's because they see things differently. Working with dyslexic children, you see that their minds work in very diverse ways. They're able to see the world in a way that we are not. The strengths they have are incredible. The way they can think around things, the ability to see the big picture. They are problem solvers. They are outside the box thinkers, because they process information differently, they're able to see things from different angles. Many dyslexics are also very good at visualizing the big picture, uh, thinking through multiple steps and seeing connections, um, almost a symphony of ideas that they can bring together. Dyslexics are um, exceptionally curious learners. They're eager to explore. Um, if you tell a dyslexic that something is done in one way, um, they will find three, four, or five other ways to demonstrate that exact same skill. Some of our, the greatest innovations, some of the greatest breakthroughs in our history have come out of a dyslexic mind's refusal to just accept the status quo. They ask why constantly which is fun in the classroom. They don't just take information for what it is. They want to know why. They want to know the background. They want reason for it. Dyslexics tend to be very creative and very good at uh, imagining new ideas. They tend to be innovators. Uh, they tend to be entrepreneurs. The game changers in our world or that disrupt industries. 
um, that provide solutions that we didn't even know that we needed or to solve problems we didn't even know we had. So many of our dyslexic learners that are in our classrooms that go unidentified, certainly they suffer because they're not able to reach their full academic potential. But I would say even more than the academic consequences, the social emotional problems that come with it are, are catastrophic. To sit in a room and know that you're capable and yet not be able to show it year after year can be devastating. We're not teaching kids to think, we're teaching kids to pass exams. If education is a challenge for a child with dyslexia, you need to understand how to educate them so that it isn't a challenge. One in five children suffer from dyslexia. That's 20% of the classroom. And yet, teachers aren't trained to recognise it. I think it's vital that 
teachers are trained about dyslexics. Because the world is changing and, uh, and imagination is key to everything and there's going to be a lot of kids whose potential are lost unless we train our teachers to effectively teach them. Imagine a world where you've got, you know, a little, where you've got like a force of people who have this gift of dyslexia educated in a way that supports them. It means anything's possible, you know, it means anything is possible. I felt stupid and I felt less than other people then and I can still, I mean I was so little and I can still remember that feeling. I didn't like that feeling. However, that feeling is part of what kicked me to work harder and try to overcome. I have no regrets about having dyslexia at all. I think it gave me different strengths and resilience and made me focus on my skills as soon as I found them. <laughs> okay, so what is my final conclusions of this documentary? Well, it's simple. Dyslexia is not a barrier to success. You just have to find your dyslexic superpower and you have to find the tricks that work for you. I'm Katrina Nigolina Jorgensen Aha and this was my documentary about dyslexia. Thank you and goodbye.